Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, it's coming up. It's coming. To all your parents out there, you're welcome. <laughs> There is a, an image, a saying in our culture that really doesn't need any explanation. It's what happens when we get caught with our hand in the cookie jar. There's this myth that children are just so honest. Now maybe yours were or are. My two sons, when they were much younger, were playing around in the living room, and all of a sudden I heard something break. So I ran out to make sure they were okay. Right? <laughs> and I might have asked, who broke that? And they both looked at me and went, <laughs> So you get caught with your hand in the cookie jar. That said about you, that's never a good thing. Which brings me to today's text. To kind of recap it, we have a manager who's been stealing from his employer for a long time. The employer finally finds out about it, calls the manager in, presents the documentation, and says to the manager, you're fired. Now the manager is taken a little bit back by that. He, he thinks to himself, I'm I'm too weak to do manual labor. I'm too proud to beg. What in the world am I going to do? And so he comes up with a plan. And his plan is to invite the people who owe his employer as co-conspirators and engages them in being dishonest. He says to one who owes a bunch of olive oil, cut your bill in half. Says to another who own, owes some bus, uh, baskets of wheat, oh, cut 20% off the top. And he does this so that now these people owe him. Now, if the parable ended here, we could well, we could write some appropriate endings. Jesus may say that the manager had a sudden come to Jesus moment, realized that he had been living dishonestly, throw himself on the mercy of his employer, say, I will work to repay all I've taken. Now, that would be a good ending, right? be a good ending. Or perhaps if he remains unrepentant, Jesus would say he get cast into the outer darkness where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That would be a good ending. Or at least a few years in the pokey. That would be a good ending. But that's not the ending. The ending is he gets rewarded for his dishonesty. I don't like this text. In fact, I don't know of any clergy person who would even dare to preach on this text. A long time ago, I used to go to a, a textual study with other clergy. <laughs> a waste of my time. Um, <laughs> And one time it was this text, and every one of them said, oh, I'm preaching on the other one. 
But you see, it wasn't just me. It wasn't just the other clergy who had a problem. Luke obviously has a problem with this parable. And so he, he throws in some, some probable explanations. He said, well, you do know that the, the children of our era are more shrewd than the children of the light. Did he just call us stupid? <laughs> I think he did. Well, obviously, Luke probably thought about that and said, well, no. Those who are honest with a little will be honest with well, Those who are dishonest with a little will be dishonest with a lot. How's that one working for you? Hmm. But there's this problematic line. Make friends with your dishonest wealth. So when the wealth is gone, you will still have your friend. Really? Really? Is that how that works? So what in the world is this about? about forgiveness. It's about forgiveness which tries to dispel two nasty little myths. <coughs> we have over the centuries Develop this idea that people in the church should be nice. We all believe that. And yet, if you're really a serious student of Jesus, there were times he wasn't very nice. In fact, there were times he was downright rude. And it was interesting because he was always rude to the religious people. He called those religious people hypocrites. Now there's a saying about Jesus, that Jesus showed compassion, comfort to those who were afflicted but Jesus also afflicted those who were comfortable. Kept challenging them. But there's this idea of nice which permeates the conversation. Especially when it comes to clergy. For some reason, I'm supposed to live to a different standard. I had a friend who got a call to a small community, and it was one of those kind of pietistic <coughs> churches, kind of church my grandmother had grown up in. And my grandmother was very adamant that dancing was of the devil, as was alcohol. And so my friend goes to this community and the president of the council is sister, you know, our pastors aren't allowed to drink. So whenever he wanted to buy a six pack to go with the burgers he was cooking, he had to go to the town over. <laughs> There was another pastor friend of mine who had two children, both adopted, and 
one of the elder people in the congregation said, that's such a nice way for a pastor to have children. <laughs> <laughs> may take you a while, but you'll figure it out. <laughs> But in fact, this niceness is what breeds this whole thing of passive aggressiveness. Our inability to be honest with each other. There's a wonderful book called Sacred Cows Make Gourmet Burgers, and in there he talks about this dynamic within the context of congregations. How many times we have this conversation with one another and we're smiling, and as soon as their back is turned, we carve them up. See, there's nothing nice about this parable. It's pretty harsh. And the second part of this about forgiveness is that forgiveness is extremely difficult. It's extremely hard. There was a well-known pastor who had basically built his career <coughs> lamenting the evil <coughs> of pornography, lamenting the evil of the sexual mores which had sort of engulfed our nation. And there was a reporter who thought, hmm, he seems to protest too much. And so he followed him. And after standing up in the front of the church, in front of thousands and thousands of people screaming and yelling about the tragedy the sexual mores of our time, he would then get in his car and go to New Orleans and visit a brothel. When confronted, like the manager caught with his hand in the cookie jar, the next Sunday, the pastor gets up in front and with tears streaming down his face, says, I've sinned against God and God has, has spoken to me and forgiven me and so you as the congregation have no choice. Unfortunately, the congregation didn't buy him. They threw him out as they should have. We can be forgiven by God. But we have to do the hard work of seeking that forgiveness against those that we have harmed. Jesus puts it this way. If you come to the altar with your gift and you have not been reconciled to your brother or sister, leave your gift, go back and be reconciled, and then come and your gift will be accepted. And that work, that work of being reconciled to one another is downright hard. Nearly impossible. In every congregation I've served, I've challenged them. But the only way I can think of you know, Sort of put this into kind of flesh and blood of how difficult it is. We all have something that we cherish. Now I'm not talking about your children, because you can't really give them away. Or your spouse. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about we all have something which we really value. Maybe it's an heirloom. Maybe, I don't know what it is. You want to see how difficult this is? 
take that which is most valuable to you and give it to somebody else. When I started doing this, the very first time was very, very, very difficult. I had a beautiful piece of artwork that I had purchased. There was an art auction and the proceeds went to help charity. I had this beautiful, beautiful piece of artwork. And I had this couple in the congregation and she said, oh, I just adored that. And over the months, I kind of thought about that. So one day I took it off of my wall, I drove over to her house, and I handed it to her. I said, here. Now the first problem you'll encounter is people will think that this is a sound. What do you want in return? I want you to have. That's something else. Now you got a few years to go to catch up to Dorothy Anderson. Because she's 104. <laughs> she was in my congregation in Eau Claire. She still calls me a few times a year to see how I'm doing. And she is an absolute golf fanatic. And her favorite golfer is Tiger Woods. And when Tiger had his little encounter with his then wife, she was disappointed, but she didn't give up on Tiger. Well, when I was in Arizona, we had somebody in the congregation who worked for a car dealership. And the car dealership, because they provided cars for the golfers, got a couple of VIP packages. And so he came one day and he gave me one. And so on a Thursday, I went out. The Phoenix Open really isn't in Phoenix. It's in Cave Creek, probably one of the most expensive real estate places in the world. And I was there in the VIP section, and Tiger Woods is walking through, and he's signing some things. And so I held out my little VIP pass, and he said, And one day I gave that to Dorothy. Take that which is most precious to you, which you believe to be so irreplaceable, and give it away. You realize how just how difficult it is. You see, there's nothing nice about forgiveness. It's going to cost you. Look what it cost God. It cost God his only son. Hours and hours of torment. Suffocating on the cross. For your forgiveness. as I was drilling into my affirmation of baptism kids the other day, the core credo of Lutheranism is God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God did that in the event of Christ. Your forgiveness is sure, it is real, but that's only a part of it. The other part is we must be reconciled to one another. When I went to my first national youth gathering, there was a sign at the pizza place we walked into in Seattle, Washington, 1967. 
I was hardly three or four. <laughs> Emotionally. And there are over four or five, there's five of us, five country bumpkins in Seattle. <laughs> oh, good grief. And we walk into this pizza place, and above the cash register is a sign, In God we trust, all others pay cash. <laughs> God in Christ has forgiven you. That's the easy part. The hard part is reconciling ourselves with one another. To give accounting to those we have harmed. And to seek their forgiveness. It's a messy parable. It's a harsh parable. But the truth of the matter is, we've all stuck our hands in the cookie jar. And we got some work to do.